I should have gotten a glass for you. Here, let me get one. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm talking here with uh, Professor Charles Nesson. Charles Nesson is uh, the founder of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And uh, we could talk uh, and say many interesting things about this amazing project that the Berkman Center is at Harvard University. But the purpose of this first half an hour is to introduce uh, um, why we're here why we're here, why we're here under the title of Comunia, why we're here talking about university and cyberspace, and what's the relationship between these two apparently unrelated so far items. Now, we're here because there is a specific European project called Comunia. It's a Euro project founded by the European Union, and uh, it's a project that uh, was conceived in 2006 and uh, we, together with 35 other organizations, uh, concurred, made a submission uh, for this uh, call for proposals of the European Commission, was about uh, a very interesting idea that was quite new four years ago, at least in the public uh, consciousness. It was uh, a call for proposal to make a project about the public domain. Now, the public domain, uh, in the strict sense, uh, is, are those works uh, uh, that could, can be used freely because the terms of protection have expired if you take a strict uh, legal definition of it. So it was rather interesting that four years ago the European Commission that typically is involved in much more tangible and concrete, apparently concrete objects was making a call for proposal asking tens and tens of organizations to be together and discuss the public domain. And this specific project uh, is a kind of project where essentially the money is to meet and discuss, not so much to do research. So with 35 other partners, uh, we like the idea of the public domain. The call for proposal were also mentioning things like creative commons, uh, and was mentioning things like orphan works, uh, and mentioning things like the digital public domain. So with 35 other partners, we decided to make a proposal say, yes, we are interested in the digital public domain. We want to have the European Commission money to meet and discuss it. So we started doing that to explore the role of the public domain in European societies and economies. And we started doing that uh, by meeting every three months all over Europe, from Vilnius to, to Torino, from London uh, to Istanbul. And uh, we started looking at the digital public domain, trying to find a definition, trying to find ways to explain it to people outside our network, to try to understand what, what are the implications for technology, for economy, for our culture, for policies, for education, for science. So we devoted uh, 12 meetings, and this is the final one, to discuss the digital public domain, and in the meantime, subgroups of the people of this project started discussing specific aspects. So we had a group specifically looking at public domain in education and science, or public domain in economics and business model, public domain and memory institutions. And you will find on the, project, on the website of the project a large wealth of information because one of our guiding principles for us was we want to meet and we want first of all to have public meetings like this one, free of charge so that people could come and attend, but also we wanted to produce as much material as possible online free of charge. So on the project website you will find our discussions going back to, to January 2008 uh, with a very liberal license, uh, so material that you can read, you can reuse, you can remix, you can give to other people. And in the working groups uh, along the way they also produced uh, uh, surveys, for instance, on open universities. We produced uh, a public domain manifesto, uh, which has been signed by thousands of individuals and hundreds of organizations. We started to celebrate uh, um, the public domain day on January 1st, and we will do it again 
much more forcefully, we hope, uh, on next uh, January 1st. So, uh, you will hear more about the Comunia project uh, in a specific session uh, tomorrow afternoon, where key uh, players in the Comunia project will tell you more of the main results of this project that is going about to end. But what is the public domain? I told you the strict legal definition, so works for which the terms of protection have expired, but maybe from this very short introduction that I'm giving you, you have an idea that it's maybe broader than that. So the first thing I would like to ask Charlie Nesson is, is it broader? What is the public domain in your view? Well, <clears throat> I think of the public domain from a student's point of view. Somebody coming onto the net and the public domain is everything that someone coming onto the net can access for free without feeling at risk that they're going to be sued. So it's actually the free space of the net that is open as a common wealth of all citizens of the net. I, yesterday we were talking and uh, me and other people were struck by the idea that the public domain is what you can do. Absolutely. The public domain is a relationship to the individual in which the individual is empowered both to access a tremendous wealth that is just a click away and is also empowered to create to contribute to the public domain. That is, if, if I would like to use my creativity in some way that is open to the public world, that's the methodology of, of creativity and access to the domain. And it's in some ways surprising how impeded that is by existing structures. So many times when uh, we discuss about uh, content online, there is this idea that uh, uh, the only or the most important use is just consuming and therefore all these uh, metaphors of piracy, of stealing, uh, and there is so little emphasis on the fact that you can actually do things with the things that you find online. You can actually have entrepreneurial ideas. So you can recreate and remix uh, existing ideas in order to make your point. So this, uh, there is, a, a, in my view, a lack of emphasis on what you can actually do, not simply consume. Yes, and I, I would relate that to what I think of as the, the problem of the Internet. The Internet comes as a kind of amazing invention. I, I have the benefit in my lifetime of having gone from just the very first little bits to seeing this amazing Internet environment, cyber environment that we're in. But, when you ask who, who are the major, what are the major foundations for internet, you can think of, well, there's government and there's business, uh, but govern, government's interest tends to be very much worried about what you can do negatively with the net, so into security and worries and fears and business is all concerned about being able to track a transaction and you get the image of the businessman wanting to be at the juncture point so that they can say stop here pay a toll now go for forward and there's neither of those major constituencies are as far as I can see institutionally committed to freedom on the internet and so when you ask, where is the institution in our society that is genuinely committed to the creation of knowledge, free access to knowledge, the enjoyment of knowledge, the pleasure of creating knowledge, that's university. And uh, with internet having started as a university experiment and expanded initially mm -hmm. with university, 
it just, it just seems it's now an appropriate time for a university to examine its own self-interest in the development of the open net and become a kind of institutional foundation for promoting it and protecting it. Absolutely. Before um, talking more about the role of universities, if you were to talk to a politician, an influential policymaker, and you were wanted to uh, convince him or her to act in favor of the public domain, what would you say to convince him or her? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, in, when, when I feel we started with the Berkman Center and then later next, uh, it, it was pretty much the case that people didn't know what the public domain was. One, one of my colleagues, Larry Lessig, argued a case in front of the United States Supreme Court mm -hmm. in 1998 that was protesting the ever lengthening protection for copyright, saying, no, no, there's no reason to give basically infinite protection to copyright. And he was arguing on behalf of the public domain. And yet, the justices of the Supreme Court, really, you could see, they really didn't, they really didn't understand what he was talking about. I mean, how is it that we come to value the air that we breathe and the water that we drink and the knowledge that surrounds us? It's like, I, I truly believe that we won't come to totally appreciate it until the generation of digital natives that has grown up within this world gets to a point of maturity where they can really feel and express the idea that this enormous freedom that we experience whenever we go into the cyber environment is a thing of just enormous value. So when you say value, I imagine that you, you think of the world in, from different points of view, uh, political value or cultural value. Is it also an economic value? Do you see that, that by strengthening the public domain, we're also encouraging new ways of wealth creation, wealth also in the sense of economic sense? Well, I think no question that we've seen the economic benefit to businesses at being able to reach basically the whole population with their sales pitch. So the economics have been overwhelmingly emphasized and the net is in some way under pressure to change its architecture to support the economics. Uh, or oh, none of that would have happened unless there was access to that free space. It's just the instinct of, of I think, to some extent, business and government to constrain it in order to improve their own situations, but in, in some sense at the expense of the explorer, the, the cyber knot, the young student who is exploring and thinking of new things, inventing new ways to use and creating new things for other people to use. And how do you see the, the metaphor that some people are suggesting that um, we should talk about the public domain in, in, a, in the way that the environmental movement started decades ago talking about the environment? Uh, decades ago, people were not at all sensitive as they are now to the quality of air, to the importance of water, of a, of a, a common green uh, patrimony. It, is it a metaphor that convinces you? Do you think we, we could use the same route to explain to even to the ordinary citizen the importance of the public domain? Absolutely. Uh, to me, the metaphor that most captures the goal is the idea of national parks mm -hmm. in cyberspace. Now, they won't be national, they'll be international. But when I think about the way the United States developed, here was this amazing open land and people claimed it for farms and so forth, but it wasn't until 
people came to recognize how valuable open space is, that we established our own in the U.S. national park system. And as you look back on it, that was such a brilliant thing to do when, when, when you see how badly developed so much of the territory is, and then you go to a space where it's truly open. And yes, so I think the, the cyberspace is an environment. It is, it is a space, and uh, how it's built is up to us. Uh, on the third day, uh, we, in the schedule, you find a, a talk by David Bollier, who unfortunately, unfortunately had to go back to the, to the U.S. Uh, this morning. And he was going to underline uh, the connection between these natural parks and cyberspace and the physical commons, the broader movement uh, of the commons. And other people, too, underlined that uh, people caring about uh, the natural parks in cyberspace uh, should ally themselves more openly, more explicitly, with the people uh, caring about uh, uh, the commons of water, or the commons of, uh, of parks in the physical world. Do you see this connection as strategically important? Or can we go on, each, each of us, in our own domain? Well, I think about the open access movement mm -hmm. in universities. So in one sense, it's very individual. It's what you or I, as academic people, um, we have our own creative talents. Uh, it's not like cyberspace is out there and we discover it. It's not like Columbus comes upon it and, whoa, there it is. It's actually something that individuals collectively can create and contribute to. And the, the, the constituency in the world that seems to me to be in some ways most suited to creation and contribution is the academic world. I mean, it's our mission, personally. We, we commit ourselves to a, a life relating to knowledge rather than money. No, nobody goes, I won't say nobody, nobody goes into the academic business in order to make money, at least not many people go into the, right. So, so the idea that this is at once a, a, a global enterprise of building public space mm -hmm. and at the very same time an individual mm -hmm. enterprise of personal expression, that, that to me is the combination. I mean, it's like, it's like the rivers and the streams and the air and the forests, except that they were all there and we come and look at them. This is slightly different, fundamentally different, in that this is the aggregation of what we ourselves have create and create for the future for our children and so forth. Right. You, you've reached the, the topic of uh, universities and cyberspace. Uh, Let's start from, actually you already started talking about that, the foundation of this conference. This conference is broader, is university in cyberspace and how to reshape knowledge institutions in a network age. It's, so the scope is larger than universities and the public domain. Uh, but that was the foundation. And you already mentioned that, that what you mean by why universities have this important role uh, with regard to the public domain. Uh, do you think that universities, generally speaking, are already aware of the role they have? Is it uh, uh, already happening to some extent? Uh, what should we do if this is not the case about it? I think it's a growing awareness. Uh, right now, if you're in the university world and you do research, it's a very different form of research than 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you put on a green eye shade and you went into the depths of the library and you stayed in the stacks for years upon years and you emerged with something. Now people research from their offices with the online databases. And if you ask now, what is the university library? Yes, it's that big building that's down there with the books, but functionally for researchers and students in the library, 
it's also everything you can reach through the net. Mm -hmm. And so I think university is coming to see that, in a sense, cyberspace is its library. And so the idea of contributing to the library, maintaining it, I mean, the, the, to me, one of the most interesting features of, of coming to Europe is the sensibility of cultural heritage and a fear that you can somehow see it dissipating in the lack of attention that it receives in, as, as something focused upon in a homogenous internet environment. But the idea of universities as cultural centers and centers for their particular geographic and ethnic uh, place in the world and as articulators and as conservators and as shapers so that when public comes to the net this cultural heritage is there alive and being tended to that again seems to me to be an ideal role for uh, university in cyberspace right and uh, I was saying that university in cyberspace uh, is broader than that because during these three days we are of course going to explore the role of universities with respect to the commons of knowledge but also we will look at other important matters that uh, allow us to understand or try to understand what's going to happen in the next uh, several years we're going to look at uh, digital natives so this young generation that is coming that you already referred to so how do they behave what do they think what do they expect from universities what are they going to give to universities not only what they're going to demand and we're going to look at the evolution of the library you just mentioned it very very brilliantly that now the library is cyberspace but it, that does that mean that the library disappeared the actual physical library or the virtual libraries probably not so what's the evolution there and we are going to look at uh, physical spaces, uh, particularly in the relationship to virtual extensions. So we have these three tracks going through the three days, and today is going to be the day where the keynotes will be delivered in order to bring everybody on the same plane regarding these three topics. And uh, they will shed some light on uh, what the relationship with the university and cyberspace will be. Digital natives, uh, the evolution of the library, physical spaces, virtual spaces. You, I remember when uh, Second Life just started, you all the uh, full course on Second Life. Is it, is it right? How was that experience, for instance? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> well, let me just step back for a moment, if I sure. may. Uh, Juan Carlos is a man that I met in 2005. Uh, the Berkman Center under the leadership of Terry Fisher, uh, whom you'll meet later on, uh, had started a program called ILAW, in which the various faculty members associated with the centers basically taught uh, in a small conference format uh, what, what, our, what we were thinking about. And um, Juan Carlos somehow noticed this and invited us to Turin in 2005. So that was my first visit here. And it was at, on that occasion when meeting you, I, I felt I met someone who shared the vision. I felt you, you understood it. You were surrounded by these, to me, wonderful people committed to open access and creative commons and open code. And uh, you, had a, you, you had something going. And so the idea that from that start we've come to this point is it's, it's in a way expressive of the very trajectory of the growth of this idea from, of the public domain as something people didn't even know what it was increasingly to something that feels like it's a movement that could take hold at an individual and institutional level and really go somewhere. So I just want to express my personal gratitude to you for taking an idea that was only an idea 
and bringing it to a conference. And uh, my gratitude as well to the wonderful team at Berkman, um, many of whom you'll meet, uh, Urs Gasser, uh, John Palfrey, uh, Terry Fisher, Stuart Schieber. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that David Bollier had to oh, go you. back. I didn't realize that. But uh, Colin McClay, uh, many uh, numbers of others whom I, I, I hope you will meet. And so I may have lost the thread of your question. No, but no, no. It, uh, since several people are here attending the conference uh, because they genuinely want to understand what uh, university and cyberspace, uh, uh, the interaction between the two will, will bring in the, in the next few years, uh, if you more broadly, so not just thinking about the relationship however important with the public domain, but more broadly, if you were to talk to a university administrator, to the president of your university or of another university, and you would sum up the main challenges and main opportunities that the internet uh, poses to universities, what would you choose to say? Well, I think I'd, I think I'd start with where I believe many people in university begin. Mm -hmm. the, people don't naturally think of university as an open environment. The university over history has existed in a monastic kind of away uh, and uh, quite separate from the public which um, and, and university clearly sees its own institution as a business mm -hmm. in many respects and so quite naturally falls into the idea of thinking of what universities produce as their property mm -hmm. to be protected and charged for uh, and that's a completely understandable, historical way, a legitimate way of thinking of university. But universities at the very same time are obviously at a transition point in terms of the long history of communications technology. And the internet represents in its way a transition point. It's, it's an environment that changes the default. The original default is closed. The internet default starts open. And so for university to actually conceive itself as a kind of algorithmic organism moving through time and space at a point where the challenge is really to adjust and survive in a new environment that, to me, has dimension for university thinkers, mm -hmm. which take it out to the, farther, the, the, the furthest element. Uh, we're clearly just at the beginning of it. We, we're, if you think of cyberspace as a, a growing network, mm -hmm. when it begins, all right, we see the network, but we don't initially see the strength of the network. We don't see how the aggregation of the talents of uh, a network of people can be turned to fruitful enterprise. Uh, to me, Wikipedia is like a flash of insight that should strike everyone. Look at this amazing ability through an algorithmic structure to, to allow the goodwill of thousands upon thousands of people to aggregate and come together to produce something that's genuinely useful. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's just the first. That's like the first beginning evolution of collective strength and the use of human intelligence to bind it together in ways that are commonly productive. But if you see Wikipedia as just the very beginning, uh, then expanse opens up. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't mean to limit this entirely to nonprofit. Uh, uh, I'm completely impressed with Google Maps mm -hmm. and Google Earth. I mean, amazing. 
and I'm totally open. I can go, I can link to it, I can teach my students with it, and so many more things like that where we are learning how to use this growing environment in ways that produce genuine public wealth. And that, to me, is a, a challenge of invention that should be a focus of university. How to use this environment to create knowledge in new ways. It's, it's, a, it's a worthy uh, focal point for the university administrator who starts from this closed environment but sees, hey, we're going into a new space and my job is to somehow order my university and orient my university towards production and survival and thriving in this new environment. And uh, it links uh, beautifully to something that recently Joe Ito wrote about university. He was saying that maybe the, one of the main uh, challenges will be for universities, universities to understand how to mix formal and informal learning, meaning that students will be able to learn using cyberspace in a much more unstructured way. And university will, will have to find a way how to verify and certify even this informal learning and mix it with the regular structured learning. And uh, that's uh, quite a change uh, of perspective for universities. Yes. I'd, I'd, also, I'd add, an, I'd add an, an element of caution in it as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is an enthusiasm that one can feel for internet and expansiveness and so forth. But it's easy to make mistakes as well. So universities, take a very specific example. Uh, laptops in the classroom. Mm -hmm. This is an, an issue that I think every teacher confronts in some way. You, you want to use it, you see it, there must be possibility, and yet at the very t time you do it, you risk undermining something that's been very valuable mm -hmm. before, which is a classroom of people, all of whom are paying attention. Right. Um, now suddenly you have a classroom of people and they're all and maybe that's not exactly what you want. So how you, how you mix these two environments in a way that leads to progress rather than dis deterioration, that, that is definitely a challenge. Yeah, one of the things that we are trying to do with this conference, uh, it's just an attempt, of course, is to try to envision these, these ways of behaving and uh, new rules of conduct uh, uh, before they become an actual problem, because the, before there is a, a strong just uh, reaction of, uh, of people re refusing to interact with technology. So we have to find the right uh, combination, the right uh, rules of behavior. Um, this conference uh, that started two years ago from, uh, from this, your vision of university and cyberspace, has now achieved uh, a rather structure, a rather well-developed structure and uh, I will say a few words about that so that the audience uh, can decode the program. I mentioned the three tracks, uh, and the three tracks today we will have the keynotes, uh, then there will be two breakout sessions for the three tracks tomorrow morning and on Wednesday afternoon. And the breakout sessions are just like that. People interested in digital natives can meet with other people interested in the same topic and try to hear about interesting case studies, uh, think about what are the main points uh, regarding digital natives that they want to relate to the other people in the conference. But then, when we created the program, we were afraid that people would break up three, in three tribes and talk among themselves. So, in the second day and the third day, we have these plenary sessions bringing everybody together because the informational infrastructure, the library, on the spatial infrastructure, space, both physical and virtual, are just means to an end. And the end is the mission of university. Therefore, on the third day, you will have three sessions, uh, plenary sessions. Everybody will be back here in Aulamania. And we will talk, be talking about the three fundamental missions of university. Two of them as have already been mentioned. One is producing new knowledge, therefore research. The second is educating students, so a platform for learning. And the third one, which we added, is the civic role of universities. Universities 
are not, at least in my opinion, are not simply a box where students come out, come in, and then get out with a certification, with a diploma. And it's not only, although it's extremely important, a box that produces PDF or scientific papers. It's a public institution, has a role in our society, has a role in our democracies. And therefore, the first session tomorrow morning will be trying to, to bring out this aspect because we have uh, not only a job to do, but also responsibilities, civic responsibilities. I would like to hear a few words about this specific point uh, of the civic role of universities. Uh, it's, a, to me, a very important but very delicate point. Universities have traditionally tried to stay out of politics mm -hmm. so that when business or government decides to pass some new restriction on the internet environment, it's not been a natural path for universities to rise as a voice and say, no, you're closing down this space. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow it's very important for universities, that, on the one hand, to maintain a distance from uh, political society, and at the same time, the notion of universities having a stake in cyberspace that is really self-interest, I mean, take it all the way to the idea of this is our library, then when action is being considered in the civic environment that affects the architecture of the space, then I think universities should look towards a, a role of civic citizenship that actually recognizes the importance of themselves as stakeholders in this space. And I hope that we'll be able to represent ourselves well. Thank you. And besides the plenary sessions and the keynotes, we're going to have also six uh, short plenary talks uh, called uh, High Order Bits, uh, two per day. And uh, the High Order Bits are going to give uh, uh, maybe an original point of view, an interesting topic that is out of the traditional schemes. And so you will find them one each uh, morning and one each afternoon. And uh, if you look at the conference program, another way of decoding it is that uh, uh, there is a narrative behind it. Today, we're all freshmen. Today is the first year in university. Today, we don't know anything about university and cyberspace. And we will try to learn something about it. And the keynotes will be there to bring all us freshmen on the same level and starting to learn. Tomorrow, as sophomores, we will uh, explore new directions and go more in depth with the breakout session. And finally, the third day is going to be approaching graduation. We will try to make a synthesis, uh, get some new inputs, but get a synthesis, uh, and above all, to wonder about uh, what's next, because uh, one crucial thing about conferences is that uh, they should really look forward, not just into the event itself. So at the end of the third day, each of us should uh, have learned something, but also should have also some idea about what are the priorities for looking ahead. So this is the, our, the narrative that we propose to you, and we try to, to live up to the expectation. But let me conclude this conversation with Charles Nesson asking, what do you personally expect uh, from the conference? What would you make you happy on Wednesday afternoon when there will be a final session here on the same stage? Uh, what would you define it as a, a success or at least an accomplishment? It's already an accomplishment as far <laughs> as I'm concerned. It's already a pleasure. It's, uh, I'm just so pleased that this event is and grateful that this event is actually taking place. It's, perhaps this is a historic event. That, that depends on the future. Mm -hmm. But just for the sake of being here and having the people come and talk about this issue, that is such an immediate gratification and uh, pleasure. I, uh, on behalf of the Berkman Center, I, I welcome you all to this. Thank on you. The, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> But it could be a historic event. It, it could be a point 
that some years later, when we look back to it, we will see this as a mark along the way mm -hmm. to universities being a real constituent of the space in a very active and positive sense. And so that, that would be the ultimate mark of success, but only to, to come in the future. Very well. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.